Good morning. My name is Melinda Herring, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Center. We are so happy to have you here for this very important conversation. It's called, How Can Ukraine Defeat Putin's Energy Blitz? And I'm joined by four wonderful Ukrainians. I have Oksana Nechaparenko, who is the Director of the Ukraine Crisis Coordination Center and former Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Alexei Honcharuk. Oksana is no stranger to the Atlantic Council. You see her on a lot of our panels. She's in Kiev today, and we're so happy to have her. We're also joined by Lena Zerkal, who's former Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine and a great expert on energy. Next up, we have Volodymyr uh, Kuritsky, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the National Grid Operator, uh, Ukra Energo, and he's going to explain everything about what's happening in Ukraine now. And then finally, we have Alexandra Azarkina, who's the Deputy Minister of Infrastructure of Ukraine, and she's held up on a phone call, but she will be joining us shortly. So today we are going to talk about what Putin is doing to Ukraine. We know that he wants to make this a cold, dark, miserable winter, and it is that already. So we are going to talk about the vulnerability of the power grid. And the power grid in Ukraine is quite a bit different than it is in Europe or America. So we brought together four people to help explain that. So I'd like to first start with Volodymyr. Volodymyr, thank you so much for your time today. So uh, this is an obvious question, but you need to explain it to us. Many people are looking at Ukraine the way that they look at Western Europe, which had a gas and oil problem and not a grid destruction problem. Could you please lay out the difficulties that your country faces in really basic terms? What are the sources of energy on the grid by percentage? In other words, what percentage comes from gas or nucle nuclear? And how have the recent attacks on both resources and the grid affected those numbers? Volodymyr, the floor is yours. Welcome. Hello, Melinda. Hello, everyone. So Ukrainian power grid uh, is operating under very uh, specific circumstances, uh, which are uh, extensive massive missile attacks that uh, had no, have not happened uh, ever before in any country. And uh, un unfortunately, we already had to experience seven waves of this massive attacks and uh, many other hits which are smaller, which were smaller in uh, terms of volume and uh, quantity of missiles. And around 1,000 uh, 1, heavy missiles and kamikaze drones were launched specifically at electric infrastructure of Ukraine. And this is the most important characteristical feature of our situation now, because uh, Ukraine uh, experiences biggest problem uh, resulted uh, in uh, from uh, stemming from this uh, big destruction of the grid. Essentially, there is no big thermal or hydropower plant in Ukraine that uh, has not been hit during this time since October 10th, when these attacks started. And if, we, if you look at the Ukrainian power system, you would see that around 50% of the output is produced from nuclear power plants, uh, and around 35% of the output are produced at thermal power plants. Uh, let me say 25% of uh, coal-fired, 10% uh, gas-fired power plants. Uh, and then we have uh, hydropower generation in Ukraine and small percentage of renewables, uh, covering the rest 15%. So uh, currently, uh, the biggest problem is not the stock of natural gas of stock or stock of coal. The, the biggest problem, of course, is this uh, massive, uh, vicious destruction of power grid and power plants, result, which results in uh, two things. First of all, there is a big deficit of generation currently in Ukraine, uh, around 30, 20 to 30 percent of the deficit, which uh, we cannot compensate by internal generation means. And therefore, we have to roll out uh, power, sequential power cuts to businesses and population to maintain stability of the grid, to maintain this perfect balance between production and consumption in the power grid. Uh, secondly, uh, they are shelling uh, the grid itself operated by Ukrainergo and uh, transmission substations. These are power, quite large objects that, uh, uh, that uh, transmit power flows uh, from big uh, power plants to consumption areas. And uh, they are actually shelling the transportation system for electricity, 
preventing us from evacuation of the electricity from nuclear, thermal, some hydropower plants to those areas which consume electricity. For example, big cities like Kyiv or Kharkiv or Lviv in the Western Ukraine. So the second problem is uh, related to uh, decreased ability of the grid to transmit energy. And uh, these strikes, uh, they uh, destroyed or damaged a lot of uh, substations in our power grid, uh, therefore uh, limiting our ability to, to balance the system, but also to transmit energy from one region to another. So now uh, we are unfortunately expecting uh, another attack. And we understand that this attack will, will happen until they probably exhaust all their heavy missile fleet. And therefore, uh, we are trying to, to decrease their, their ability to destroy our power grid in two ways. First, uh, we are looking for equipment that uh, will, be, will give us a chance to replace the damaged equipment in Ukraine. Uh, so we try to bring some auto transformers and other electric equip equipment from abroad to substitute, to replace the damaged one. Uh, and in that, in that form, we will strengthen our ability to restore the grid. On the other hand, as you know, re Ukraine requests a lot of uh, other uh, or new air defense systems that would decrease Russian uh, some uh, power from other regions to Kyiv uh, to cover uh, the consumption of this big area. And uh, if they shell, for example, transmission network, uh, we have limited ability to cover specifically Kyiv consumption, you see. So if they shell a few uh, large substations around Kyiv and one power or two power plants in Kyiv, then we have limited ability to cover consumption in this in this uh, area, in this specific area, and that that means that uh, the power cuts there might be bigger. And this is true for every other big city. And this is the uh, in, in viciousness of their tactics. They are affecting most the big cities when the 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 uh, many uh, big big portion of population is situated. Is concentrated. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. I understand. L Lena, I want to bring you in here. So uh, Ukraine needs a lot of technical equipment that Volodymyr has talked about to fix its grid. Uh, where is that equipment manufactured and how quickly can the, uh, the grid be repaired? You know that Ukraine has a very specific, robust and very well-designed electricity network. Uh, before uh, this strike of 10th uh, October, we exported electricity to Europe, but now we experience a lack of generation, approximately 30%, because most of uh, generation was affected by missiles and uh, around 50% of the network was hit. So we have now an absolutely different reality. Once ago, or a little bit more than months ago, we could export. Now we highly need an import from Europe to survive and not to let Russians a chance to lead to the humanitarian catastrophe in such cities like Kiev and Kharkiv. We very much depends now on supplies of this high voltage equipment, as well as other equipment which is necessary for small generation. Because we need to install this equipment of small generation to the critical infrastructure and not to uh, let Kyiv freeze next time during the attacks. Because every week we have the drop of temperature at least on two or three degrees. Yeah. So that's mean that we are in front of winter and the harsh winter period in Ukraine, it's January and the beginning of February. So we are very limited in our abilities to ensure that our system can work properly yeah. and to install this equipment and not to let Putin uh, actually uh, achieve his goal 
for the humanitarian catastrophe and the new huge wave of Ukrainian refugees in Europe. Because we do understand that the price for the such a wave of refugees in Europe will be much more higher than in the beginning of this year in February. Because now he affects all Ukrainian cities in the east, in the center, and also on the west. So actually, blackout is the common problem for the whole Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's not only the problem of Kyiv and Kyiv region. We all suffer from this blackout and the absence of the most crucial things for any human, water, heating, medical services. So that's why we put forward few issues. First of all, this high voltage equipment, which we try to find all over the Europe, especially in countries of the former Soviet bloc and Warsaw bloc. They might have the used equipment, they don't uh, destroy it, but now we require everything what they can find. We also try to find necessary equipment in Asia. And we really much hope that from this region, we can supply as much as we need for the replacement of the equipment which was destroyed. Wonderful. I, I would like you to share that list uh, of equipment that you need, uh, Lena and Volodymyr, and we will be glad to publish it on the Atlantic Council website. I know that there are representatives uh, from Poland, Lithuania, and other governments watching this, and I will be very happy to circulate that list in Washington. Uh, so let's get that moving. And if you are part of the business community and work in energy, uh, we would love to talk to you as well. I will be glad to connect you with Lena and Volodymyr. Uh, I'm so happy that Alexandra Azarkina, the Deputy Minister of Infrastructure, Infrastructure of Ukraine has joined us. Sasha, welcome to the Atlantic Council. I wish you could be here with us in person. Um, I haven't had a chance to meet you in person, but I just want to say hats off. I know you guys are not sleeping and you're doing everything you can to keep people warm and safe. Uh, so thank you for your time here today. Thank you for making time with us. Uh, we're talking about all of the problems that, that uh, Ukrainians face right now, uh, and I'd like to bring you into the conversation. Uh, can you can you tell us um, about, so we've talked a little bit about the blackouts, and Volodymyr was nice enough to explain uh, why they're particularly bad in Kiev. Lana has explained some of the needs, but from where you sit at the, the infrastructure minister, ministry, what are you worried about this winter, Sasha? Melinda, thank you very much. Thank you very much, colleagues. Sorry for being late. Just sorry, I was stuck. But uh, frankly speaking, um, the worst, you know, very human like uh, things. And basically, we understand that it's more than ever when the metaphor meets the reality. And our fight against the darkness is so literal. So yes, frankly speaking, it's it's way uh, comfortable to think about our life in the cities uh, without electricity, water, heating. And we understand that uh, it's a threat. But we also understand that's the only reason Russians do that. It's because of their failure of the front line, and that's probably keep us running. And as uh, Volodymyr and Minister of Energy team is mostly responsible to warm us up and to make sure that the lives are on even under such difficult circumstances, our ministry is mostly focusing in keeping country running. So transport connectivity through the country, through the borders, that the key things we can do to make sure that we are still resistant, we're still strong, and we can continue the fight for our future. But the answer for your question is basically personal, because I'm here not only myself, but also with my five years old son. And uh, yes, it's uh, just the basic understanding that uh, we are threatened by the aggressor, which has no rules, which is terrible you know terrorist state actually but something you know which make you an angry because you know it's such an injustice basically but in the same time uh we do have support from all over the world and yes as uh, lena said uh, we are looking all over the world for the equipment we're looking for you know creative solutions and our focus now as a ministry on the passive defense so working together with Volodymyr and his team to make sure that if we don't have enough air defense weapons and we obviously not at least we need you know to find a ways to protect us 
as much as possible and always. And here we have support from the allies as well through the expertise, through the ways how to make it possible. But at the same time, we will be quite unique in several items, in the several projects, because we understand even after the victory, there will be you know a lot of time for us to rethink the way our society, our cities, our energy and infrastructure overall will be structured. So yeah, that's basic intro, ready to jump in for the questions or discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Sasha. And thank you for, for making this personal because this is ultimately about people. Uh, and the pictures that I see coming out of Ukraine uh, are, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're special. You guys are working in the dark, you're raising children in the dark, uh, and you guys are not moving and you're undeterred. And I think that really inspires uh, the West. Talk to me, Sasha, though, about your amazing railways. There's an article, Alex, I'm going to ask you to drop it in the chat. There's an amazing story in the New York Times over the weekend about your railways. And I think you have every right to be so proud of the iron railways. Uh, tell our audience uh, what you guys have done with the railway system during the war. What 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 is it? What is the railway it's accomplished? So basically, um, Frankly speaking, uh, the first thing which surprised everyone, including ourselves, is that um, Ukrainian rails always was a bit, you know, way complex and difficult and problematic asset. And we were planning to reform it, to, you know, invite more private businesses inside it, etc. Uh, but in the end, when we <laughs> received, you know, full-scale invasion, we understood that it's quite a, you know, plus, more plus than a minus, that we have it in the, in the hands of state. And frankly speaking, that was so obvious because we understood that, you know, each normal business is trying to save their assets and move them outside the war zone, which is obviously and probably normal if you're going on the under the, you know, market or capital uh, logic. But for the state, when we understood that we have such a body with such, you know, assets, we such capacities, we're just obliged to use them. And it, like, it just was so obvious that it's good that we have this asset in our hands. The same actually for the Ukraine. And also it's interesting to see um, how before we were thinking that it's, it's a problem of Ukrainian rails that they have, you know, like a state inside the state. 240,000 people working in there, their own production sites, because nearly everything they can produce by their own, you know, starting from the spare parts for the rails. Um, they do have their own, uh, by the way, energy system. <laughs> they do have their own, you know, substations, etc. And, you know, coming down to the production of the mineral water. Mineral water in Ukrainian rails uh, wagons is, you know, made by Ukrainian rails. So it's, it's interesting, it always was one of the unique assets, which is a heritage from the Soviet Union, which this type of organization. But again, together with some market approaches, with some possibilities to be both compatible, mm -hmm. um, they showed their resistance. And also it's very interesting that historically, Ukrainian rails, they were military organization. And somehow they managed to save those traditions. And it was quite easy to mobilize all those thousands of people who had their special culture, the special way of doing things. And they were at some point most prepared than anyone. So yeah, for sure, the, uh, the key task they're providing is first of all, the humanitarian. So when we're moving uh, people, trying to save people, and uh, now we understand that um, it's, you know, so we, of course, we're relying a lot uh, on the defense logistics for the rails and our network is quite huge. Um, it's also important to understand that now we are planning to use our rail stations at those, you know, hubs, like a life support hubs where people can come, you know, again, receive some warm energy, etc., food. So those things are quite basic and uh, we're just very happy that um, everyone feels that such thing exists in the country and those assets are working for the people needs that the basic but also you know other spheres are unique too and um, frankly speaking when we were preparing the grain initiative the question uh, which we're raising every day was around the oh how can you launch the you know export from the seaports when the odessa is under a shilling etc thing um you know we are all under the rocket attacks like daily you know our truck drivers our rails they are under attacks permanently what's the difference between you know seaports and uh, other assets 
so yeah that was one of the reasons of course like people were I, I remember Odessa just before the launch of the grain initiative and I just came back uh, from there yesterday it's different it's very different of course it's all started thanks to the armed forces of Ukraine them uh, when we received the weapon which protected our coastline and yep. when we liberated liberate the snake island that was first step to the grain initiative of course the support of the partners of the you know un turkey etc etc it's important but basically it all starts with defense where you know root power and our victories and let, let me stop really, you there sasha let me stop yeah, you there sorry. no 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 that was really really great so there's an article that we've just dropped into the chat it's yeah. from the new york times it is called ukraine's 15000 mile lifeline and it is about the ukrainian railways and it explains a lot of the things that sasha just said that even though the railway was old soviet legacy had too many people so much redundancy that was a huge strength of the railways and that's why it's been so successful this article is brilliant uh sasha i think a book is going to be written about about your Ukrainian railways. It's a great story. Uh, I'd like to bring Oksana into our conversation. Oksana, thanks so much for being patient. I promise I'll come back to you, Alexandra, Volodymyr, and, and uh, Lana in a minute. Oksana, I, I want you to, to put a human face on this discussion. So we've talked about um, you know electrical de deficits, transmission substations, but this is ultimately about people. How are ordinary people and businesses coping with 12 hours or 21 hours of darkness? What do the cuts mean for hospitals and can the state still function? Oksana, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Belinda, for having me here. And um, we always say here that we have only two goals as Ukraine. A, to win and B, to survive until our army is winning. And to follow up on something with the, that Alexandra said, that as soon as Putin saw that he is losing in the front line of, because we, are, we were starting winning, he decided to get harder on the, and, and opened another huge front line, the front line to make sure that, they, that we will not survive in Ukraine. And he is sure that this winter is a focal point for him to show that he can make sure that Ukrainians will not survive. And um, I must tell you frankly that um, it's such a mixed emotion. It is so, so, so strange to talk about that. Because again, we're in the 21st century, we're now talking with you online. I, I now have light, thanks so much, Okrenerga, for that. So, uh, but we are talking with you about destroying people opportunity to live the basic needs in the 21st century and but one of the things uh, amazing things that happened that now we have so many heroes in ukraine we started in ukraine that war really brought up the army as the biggest hero for us but now all ukrainians are thankful to everybody that keeps the country running in those terms and i must tell you frankly that the food and the service in ukrainian restaurants during the war and during the blackouts, I still better than the number of other countries that I've ever been to. So this is like glory to this. But generally saying, it is very scary. It is very scary because the basic needs that you got used to is being taken away from you. You are being shelled, you're being bombed uh, all the time. And we are now talking about the period of time when Ukrainians got back to Ukraine. And what Putin is doing, He's very, he's a very, he's a sadist and he's very excruciating sadist. He makes sure that he, he doesn't want to try to destroy us, you know, in, in one time. He's trying to do it in stages. And he makes sure that we rebuild, that we are building back a little bit, and then he goes again. So he's making it in the waves to make sure that the panic will be bigger for Ukrainians, that the impact will be bigger. And you really, you really can feel it because you are now waking up each Monday and you're waiting for the air sirens to go off. If you don't hear the air sirens, you become even more worried because that means that probably he's piling up his opportunity to strike Ukraine. And that means that the next time it will be even worse. And you were talking about 12 or 24 hours of blackout, but for, for some people it was 36 hours of blackout. And again, we are talking about I don't think that actually audience will ever understand it. It's like when you are sitting in the darkness, you are hearing the bad sounds, but you also have nothing. You don't have any connection because you are, I mean, it's, you, you don't have any opportunity to call your friends, your parents, your loved ones. 
you don't have any opportunity to check the news of what is happening. Mm -hmm. You don't have uh, any light. It's becoming colder because it is cold. Um, and then it, you don't have any water. If you don't have any water, it means that in order for you to, to, to use your basic needs, like to go to the toilet, you can't do that. You have to go somewhere to find a place where to do it. And this is, again, this is crazy because we are talking about this stuff happening in very developed country. And then literally when we have, you know, we have this uh, charts of, uh, of uh, the private, if I live in a multi-story building, I live on 14th floor. So Putin probably really wanted us to be a very strong and athletic nation now because we are now all using only stairs, of course. But when I don't have any electricity, I have nothing. I don't have gas. I don't have internet. I don't have connection. I don't have water. So the general idea is that unless you are prepared, you won't be able to survive with winter with a long blackout. So you okay. have to be prepared. Oxana, what's happening with hospitals and schools now? Oh, uh, so uh, uh, a lot of the hospitals, uh, especially the big ones, they do have some. Uh, they, they do have some generators in order to make sure that when the lights are out, they can keep uh, continue working. And I think that you already saw um, this amazing pictures of um, uh, doctors who continue doing operations even during blackouts. Using the this minimum light that they have, uh, the schools, lot of schools will be now being um, uh, uh, repurposed and will be uh, created um, because now one of the biggest initiatives that our government did, they created the centers of unbreakable centers of Ukrainians for Ukrainians to go there and to have the opportunity to the center where they can plug in when when they can become warm. So lots of schools will be acting as a centers for that. And actually Ukrainians are preparing for several days blackout. And I must tell you frankly, it's like the start of the war all over again. Because you have to create a plan. What should you do? What would your friends do? What would your loved ones do when we will be have no no light and no connectivity? Of whatsoever so you have to have a contingency plans you have to find you have to find your friends who have some houses then to chip in to buy some generators to make sure that at least for several days you will have you know a place to stay but also we understand that there is a number of ukrainians who are thinking of leaving so that's exactly of what lana said that unfortunately we also should be preparing for that because again it's becoming colder each day and i'm and not only that, it's very psychologically difficult. You are you're driving through your favorite beloved city that used to be one of the most brightest and beautiful cities in the world. And you, you drive from the one of the biggest um, uh, metro stations or like the biggest liveliest neighborhoods and it's total, complete darkness. It's scary. It's scary. And, I, and we do understand that he's trying to, to break us. But... I mean, we have an amazing coping mechanism called sense of humor. So, and we have government that is standing. So we will survive, but it is, you, unless you are here, it's very difficult to, to explain. explain you. Yeah. Absolutely. Because uh, Oksana, none well, of us, none of us would think about that. You, you will remember it for the rest of your life, for sure. Oksana, tell, tell, me, tell, me, uh, tell me this. Uh, how are people talking about the decision to, to, to leave? Uh, do, do you think that a lot of people are very close to leaving or how are they going to make that decision? Uh, so, um, you know that uh, out of 10 million Ukrainians that left the country, at some point around seven of them actually were back in the country. So Ukrainians were settling back and lots of Ukrainians with children were settling back. So now it's one of the most difficult decisions in their life because they are just back in their homes. They're just back with their family. They are back with their husbands. And now it all depends on their ability to prepare for the winter. So if you have some uh, private housing um, of your friends, family, where you, which you can prepare for, for the several day, days blackout, then you are thinking of staying. If you do understand that actually, probably you will be freezing in multi-story building on the 21st floor with no opportunity even to go down or like, to, to do what then people are thinking about living so it all depends about you it all depends on your uh, preparation for for that and really it's very difficult mentally to again make the decision to leave ukraine 
I mean, it's almost impossible. Ukrainians are getting used to that. And for them, it's it's heartbroken. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, Sasha's shaking her head vigorously. Sasha, it, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it, say more about that. You're, you're, you're agreeing violently. Uh, so basically, um, again, you know, um, one of the things that which the worst imagining for me is, again, the situation with my children or child. So he spent um, five months in France because my sister lives there uh, when I was still working here. Uh, from July, he's with me, and it just you know I'm just totally happy when he's here, etc. So uh, even my story. So I'm divided between the decision that I'm staying here, fighting for the country because I think everyone now is fighting for the country in you know different positions, but he's in danger, yeah. or I'm sending him back to my sister and I'm not you know with my son for I don't know months, or I'm leaving the country and actually you know I understand that it's not very good for the country because we all, you know, all are needed in here. And it's, it's just crazy, you know, the choices we are <laughs> need to answer. And, it, and it's, there are no good answers for that. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, it, it's it's just really, I, I think it's normal for everyone in us to say that, yes, it's scary. I mean, it, it just obviously and normal because we're normal people, we're normal human. And for sure, the worst is for the vulnerable um, people, so elderly children hospitals they're where my heart because i understand when you're young when you're you know motivated you can find ways to survive and it's not as bad but uh, when when it, it goes to the vulnerable uh, people that's the worst i'm also worried uh, sasha about education so we've had two years of COVID education and we've had nine months of war uh, that's going to leave a huge imprint uh, on ukrainian society you don't need to comment on that we'll, we'll do a panel on that uh, at a future discussion uh, volodymyr i want to bring you back into this conversation what will be the role can you talk a little bit about generators how are generators filling the connectivity gaps have other countries offered to assist with smart grid technologies and mobile technologies that can help to uh, ameliorate the damage? Well, this is the point where I will have to uh, uh, take away this uh, human face from the topic and talk That's about fine. Please. Uh, this uh, tech, more or less technical things or um, give an overall picture. So uh, you see, if, uh, if we speak about a large power system as the uh, Ukrainian power system, which is fifth largest in Europe, uh, we can say that mobile mobile generators and and uh, other uh, applications that could be used uh, could be brought quickly from from abroad. Uh, they could uh, serve as a backup for those people who cannot have uh, uh, some services like electricity or heating or water supply temporarily. So they can support the uh, people which are disconnected from from normal inf infrastructure and uh, normal benefits of civilization for some time like one or two days for example or or even longer if uh, the worst scenario is realized but in terms of uh, supporting the power grid itself we would need uh, more stationary applications power plants in ukraine normally they have a capacity of 500 1000 uh, two, three thousand megawatts, uh, which uh, cannot be compensated by mobile applications. However, uh, there are some uh, technical solutions in the world that uh, that uh, that are mobile power plants mm -hmm. that can be brought uh, in Ukraine relatively quickly. They have 30, 60, 50 megawatts of capacity. And if we are able to assemble a lot of these mobile uh, power plants in Ukraine and connect them to our combined heating power plants to, to, to some regional uh, power plants that already have uh, ready to operate infrastructure, then we can at least partially compensate the deficit that we currently have in the grid uh, by these mobile applications. Uh, these are not uh, quite generators that uh, mm -hmm. uh, households would use or, 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 or shops or, or uh, or restaurants would use, but rather uh, quite large uh, industrial, but still mobile applications that uh, that could support the system. Uh, and we would combine probably different strategies. 
decrease the damage that uh, that is taken by the system on one hand mm -hmm. uh, use import of electricity from Europe to compensate par partially the deficit in Ukraine elect Ukrainian electric grid and combined also the third part of, of this equation could be to bringing some mobile power plants in Ukraine into Ukraine to install them quickly and to to have uh, additional source of power inside the country. Of course, we are all looking forward uh, for the occupation of uh, largest nuclear power plant in Europe, which is Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. That would res probably resolve uh, all our problems with deficit this winter, but uh, this uh, of course uh, depends largely on uh, our success on the battlefield. And we all hope and believe that uh, our army will be able to do that as soon as possible. May it happen as quickly as possible. Absolutely. Thank you, Vladimir. That was really helpful. And again, I would like to give you homework and ask you to write an article uh, with your great colleague next to you, what Ukraine needs now to get the lights back on. We will be so happy to help you get that published uh, and get as many eyeballs on it as possible and hopefully get you the gear you need. Uh, Volodymyr, another question for you. If we see one or two more heavy barrages of rockets, sort of the nightmare scenario that you've talked about, will the, elect uh, will the grid be kaput? Uh, and what are the alternatives? Are, 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 is there any other... Um, alternative if we know that there's going to be uh, a, a, a big barrage of missiles coming up or or, or, or is Ukraine just a sitting target? Well, look, we, we already survived seven waves of massive missile strikes. Uh, each of each of these uh, strikes uh, was ha has never happened before if we speak about targeting specifically electric grid. Yeah. So we, we survived seven waves. Um, Another one or two or, or five ways, we do not know where they will hit, where uh, how much damage they will inflict. But uh, in terms of uh, kaput of the system, uh, well, my job is to prevent that from happening. And uh, this is my uh, main uh, task now, as you understand. Uh, of course, I can also write some articles, uh, but, uh, but my main goal now is to be focused on, 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 on preventing uh, this uh, this uh, worst scenario from happening. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, if they hit hard, the, that that means only that we will start restoration as soon as possible. Every time they hit, we restore. And uh, uh, it, of course, uh, it may take uh, uh, more or less time to restore from from this uh, new missile attack. But the biggest goal for us would be to. Uh, to power the uh, nuclear power plants first, and also uh, to make sure that the critical infrastructure is powered, like water uh, supply heating uh, companies. Why? Because uh, in Ukraine, we often have uh, temperature, outside temperature of minus five, minus seven, minus 10 degrees Celsius. Yep. And uh, if uh, heating and water supply systems uh, are without uh, power, for a long time during such a temperature outside, then these systems might freeze yep. and we will not be able to uh, restart them even after we restore the power grid operation. That's why it's it's uh, essential that we are able to, uh, to provide electricity for critical infrastructure first and for, uh, for our big power plants because it will take them less time to restore their operation uh, their generation of uh, electricity for the power grid. If we quickly quickly provide power for for these power plants that might be disconnected for some time from the grid, so we have some priorities and we have some protocols in place how to how to behave in terms of uh, in, in case of uh, in case of uh, hard scenario, and we already uh, probably demonstrated that we are able to restore the more or less normal operation, in integrated operation of the power grid quite quickly in terms of hours, not days. If I may, if I may add, I Please. think that these personnel in Ukrainerga, they are magicians <laughs> because they do impossible things. They connect the whole system in one piece in hours. This is absolutely impossible to imagine in any European country. Because they had the previous experience of the beginning of war, where we were disconnected a few hours before the uh, start of the war from the Russian system. 
and were operated in the island mood. We operated in an island mood for three weeks, and it was a miracle that we survived. Now we have an experience how to restore the system, but we have to restore the system as quickly as Russians charge their devices with missiles. And this is a game, a game for the win. And we need any kind of equipment, any kind of weapon which can help us to win and to survive this winter. Because otherwise, it will not be the disaster only for Ukraine. It will be the disaster for the whole Europe. We have around 20 million population in big cities. And taking into account that all big cities are under the fire, all these people will have to find a place where to live and how to save their lives. So that's why this game and this war is not only with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. This is a global problem. And we absolutely aware about this. And that's why we fight not only for us, we fight for the peace and for the future. Thank you, Lena. Thank you for making that that uh, so clear. Okay, my friends, we have 13 minutes and we have 21 questions to answer. Are you ready? Okay, uh, Oksana's ready. First up, so if you could unmute your mic and give me just good short answers, that would be fabulous. This one is for Volodymyr and uh, you guys are, there you go. Luke Johnson wants to know, Volodymyr, is it possible for Poland and Romania to import power into Ukraine? It's possible from Romania, Slovakia and Hungary. Are you having those discussions? Yes. Super. I have to be quick, so it's it's that's all. That's you're all perfect. Have. You're ready for TV, my friend. You're you're ready for TV. Ne next up, Volodymyr, is there a plan for potential power outages in towns with the population from fifty thousand to a hundred thousand um, that are off the centralized grid? Is there any backup generators for critical infrastructure in place? So you answered the, the second part, but what about smaller towns that are off the centralized grid? What's the plan for that? Those we, have we have restoration plans for every city. And we already realized or tested these plans in reality. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, who wants to do water? I think this is for you, Sasha, from Dr. Harlan Ullman. He says, water infrastructure may be more vulnerable than energy. And without water or with contaminated water, uh, disease will become endemic. What is and can Ukraine do to preserve its water infrastructure? Frankly speaking, water now is also connected to the electricity. So each time we have failures there, we are more vulnerable in there. But also, I do think we're still quite decentralized. And as uh, from what I heard my colleagues from the Ministry of Energy mentioned regarding the uh, possibility for us to build, you know, somehow uh, the decentralized uh, system in here, yes, Kiev is vulnerable because there are a lot of centralization. It's the same with the water, but uh, people are quite creative. And still, I do think that we have a lot of opportunities. And basically, one of the uh, most important critical infrastructure objects in the country, they normally have those facilities. Now we're just, you know, repackaging everything and trying to be more prepared. There's a follow-up question, and the person wants to know um, what is required immediately to assist with water supplies. Do you guys need more uh, filtration devices? Is that something that would be useful to send? For on the south, on the east, yeah, it's a huge demand. Yes. Uh, not in the capital for the moment, but like in there, it's just very needed. So yeah, if you do have like in some technologies and something, yeah, it's a huge uh, need. Wonderful, especially in new, newly liberated territories. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, he, this question is probably for you, Oksana. This is another one from Harlan. He says, despite the spirit and courage of Ukrainians, given these attacks, what will life be like in Ukraine in February and March if the power and water inf infrastructure continue to be destroyed? What, 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 is it look, what does Ukraine look like? So A, it will be hard, and B, it will be scary. But C, we do believe in our, like like now, like we mentioned, everybody who is now keeping our country running, electricians, infrastructure, people, uh, people who clean up the street, like everybody, they are all heroes and we do believe in them. So that, that will be our answer. So it will be hard, it will be tough, but we will have no other choice because it's impossible to make control C, control V and just, you know, uh, put all the population of Ukraine into Europe. So of course, the majority of us will, will be staying. So if we will be staying, that means that we'll be looking for some new ways. And Ukrainians proved ourselves to be creative already <laughs> in surviving. 
We are not alone in here. Frankly speaking, we already have this. I'm always feeling this support, even with the electricity, which we can import a bit. <laughs> so that's that's all. We're all very connected and standing not alone. Absolutely, you are helping us to survive. That's true. Wonderful. Okay, uh, Volodymyr, another question for you, sir. If General Electric, GE in America, or its successor companies like INNIO still make massive temporary portable power and water apparatus that might save Ukraine's population, including people like Oksana stuck in high-rise apartments, have you spoken to such companies? Well, we spoke about uh, well, we spoke with such companies on uh, bringing into Ukraine some electric equipment that would uh, help us to power the stationary water supply systems and also we spoke with them uh, on these mobile generators that could brought in to ukraine and uh, serve as a backup solution for water supply uh, systems in big cities as well wonderful so if these companies are uh, if have representatives online uh, volodymyr would be glad to talk to you in more depth privately uh, volodymyr how can outside power and energy companies help ukraine is there anything else on on your wish list that you haven't mentioned well equipment electricity from abroad and mobile generators these are my wish list. this is my wish list that's your christmas list okay great um uh, and volodymyr uh, i'm gonna ask you this and then oksana uh gary zimmerman a wonderful man who's on most of our our webinars uh has a huge heart and he says what is the preferred website to donate uh generators can you give us some advice uh for americans who who want to help uh at christmas well let me let me check uh after United 24. United 24 is a universal right. platform and actually it's directly connected to all uh, state funds. United 24. Okay, Oksana, any others that you would recommend? On the generators, no, but I'll think about that and then send to you after. But okay. I would agree with her. Wonderful. We're gonna we're gonna put together a follow-up article with all mm -hmm. the equipment on Volodymyr's Christmas list and also uh give you some websites where you can help. Okay, uh another technical question for Lana or uh Volodymyr. What is the estimated magnitude of resources being asked for uh protecting the substations? Well, I think if you speak about equipment, uh, we're speaking about uh, several hundreds of millions of uh, dollar, US dollars to restore to restore the equipment that has been damaged at substations, but also power plants in Ukraine and distribution uh, level substations. If you speak about air defense systems, I'm not a military expert, unfortunately, I cannot comment on that. But if you compare this with the price for refugees in Europe, these are peanuts in comparison, yeah. because otherwise Europe will have to spend uh, billions and billions uh, to support uh, migrants and refugees. So that's why we are talking about uh, the very uh, narrow numbers now. We are not talking about the billions, we are talking about the survival and the price of this survival is pretty low. Yes, exactly. it's much more I, would like to, I would like to add that that uh, electricity imports that uh, is technically uh, possible uh, through the interconnectors between Ukraine and Europe, and also these mobile generators uh, are also of the magnitude of hundreds of millions tops. So uh, we're not speaking about uh, too too large numbers here. Yes, sir. And I also would like to add that it's much more easier for our Western partners to help uh, us to enable ourselves to protect ourselves than then to to help either to uh, to to understand what to do with refugees or to help us rebuild. Because again, as as Volodymyr mentioned, we are talking about hundreds of billions of dollars. So we already showed that we are capable, incapable in protecting ourselves. So just help us to to protect our grid too. Absolutely. No one doubts the capabilities of the Ukrainian people. No way. Volodymyr, question for you from Alan Flowers. He says, I was recently in Lviv and very impressed by the way that the electri uh, electric supply was managed after the major attacks. But can you please explain why the main nuclear power stations had to be taken offline because of synchronization problems until the grid stabilized? Are there some parts of the system which require some modernization or upgrade to avoid this problem? How could this be avoided? No, the, the explanation is very simple. Uh, if you have uh, 10 or 20 heavy missiles uh, hitting substations which evacuate power from nuclear power plants, you have immediately the problem with their connectivity to the grid. This is exactly what Russia is trying to do. This is one 
part of very important element of their strategy to dis try to disconnect nuclear generation from the grid. And therefore, because nuclear generation is so important and takes around 50 to 60 percent share of the Ukrainian consumption, then you can understand uh, why if they they are dis destroying infrastructure around these power plants, how it affects the power grid immediately. Wonderful. Robert Devine wants to know, what can we as individuals in the United States do to support you guys um, on a micro level by providing uh, portable toilets, uh, water heaters, et cetera, et cetera. And Robert, I'm the only American on this uh, call, so I'm going to answer that question. So I, I would recommend that, that you Thanks. get online and look up Razum, R-A-Z-O-M. They're a nonprofit based in New York City. They are a thousand percent reliable and they will be happy to help you move any kind of equipment uh, and you can get a tax uh, donation. So I, I would look up Razum and then Help Ukraine Center in New Jersey is also sending equipment as well. So those are the two places that I would call. Okay. Uh, Oksana Nechaparenko, you and several others have talked about uh, these centers that President Zelensky just announced, uh, indestructibility centers, I think is what they're being called. So some of our audience uh, says, this sounds cool. Tell us more about it. You can get internet and medicine. Uh, where are they? Have they been set up? And uh, tell us more. It, they call unbreakable centers, um, and uh, it's one of the biggest initiatives uh, of our government and uh, of uh, the president to make sure that Ukrainians will have a place where we, they can come during the blackout and where they can find light, uh, warm, warm food, maybe a place to stay, a place to charge, and a place to um, to get the connectivity to. So actually, this is the these, we are talking about the places of life during the blackouts, if we are talking about long blackouts. And again, if we are talking about the people who won't be able, like also the Kandra mentioned, the uh, elderly people or people who won't be able mm, to leave or they won't have a private house in with uh, generators, they would need some places where where they can uh, come up during the uh, the big blackouts to, um, to, to get some support. And uh, it's a huge network all over the country um that is being uh, and the locations are being shared with all ukrainians there is there is a list online so but maybe i kind of wanted to add something on that uh, Oksana, so. sorry one other thing if, if people want to give to these uh invincibility centers or i think that's United how we're translating it in english how do how do we do that usually through through the government initiative united 24. united 24. okay go ahead sasha sorry yeah just uh, it's never enough and unfortunately, I just don't want you know to to understand that it's very high expectations in here. It's still really, it's still just just you know schools or some basements where we try to do at least something. So for sure, it's really far yeah. from the Libraries. normal. Yeah, so just 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 really to understand that. They, but yes, um, and I saw it someone uh, Facebook uh, feed. It was like a where I am. There are this you know point of um, how you say. Yeah, so I, I mean, so it's again about the decentralization of Ukrainians and those horizontal uh, connections. Those are the strongest, for sure. Like the state is trying to be as much, you know, involved as possible. Helpful. But again, yeah, capacities are so limited. Yeah. So yeah, for sure, any any kind of the nations is important. But again, we're trying to use existing infrastructure. That's why you know rail stations for sure will be quite a point where we uh, we already have a good project with USAID, with UN, where we have those you know, different type of equipment. And actually, if someone wants to donate, use rails as well, we're ready to accept any help. And it's ongoing thing, including, you know, the volunteer helps. Remember all those kind people who are coming to Ukraine or to Ukrainian border last winter, helping our refugees, etc. I love every volunteer who help, was helping during the summer, you know, with them, people who lost their housing to just, you know, to build a new one for them. And again, this winter, that will be something very useful to receive your support in person as well. 
you have our support and you will continue to have our support. Sasha, thank you so much for being here. Oksana, thank you for being here. Volodymyr, uh, you did it. Uh, You get an A plus. Uh, You explained very technical things in such clear detail. Thank you so much. (laughs) Lana, it's always a pleasure. I hope that we can do this again soon. Our hearts are with you. We will continue to push our government uh, to send the equipment that you need. You can count on us. Thank you, guys. Thank you for spending the morning with us. It was a great pleasure. Until next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.